Hey everyone, so I guess I'll dispense with the usual bumper music and intro, because this isn't going to be the typical episode where I cover several news stories. I'm only going to be focusing on one specific topic or story this week. Recently, I was watching a Young Turks video that showed up in my feed, and in it, Cenk was railing against this political candidate who had a past connection to something called the Veiled Prophet Ball, and that's Prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, not P-R-O-F-I-T. Probably didn't need to point that out. I'm sure you'll see the spelling in the title. But anyway, you guys know me. I have this thing for bizarre, esoteric topics. So I hear a strange phrase like veiled prophet, and my curiosity is piqued. And so that's going to be the focus of this episode, digging in and trying to find out what this veiled prophet thing is all about. And for some context, the political candidate Jenk was railing against is Trudy Bush Valentine. She's a Democrat from Missouri, which also happens to be where my dog's from. Long story. Um, and she's running for the U.S. Senate. And she's also an heiress to the Anheuser-Busch fortune, which probably helps explain her and her family's connection to this veiled profit organization. It's long been criticized for being an organization for the wealthy and the elite. And one of Bush Valentine's opponents is Lucas Kuntz, I believe it is, a fellow Democrat and an attorney and Marine Corps veteran. And ahead of the August 2nd primary that recently went by, he released a political ad criticizing Bush Valentine's past participation in the Veiled Prophet Ball. And so this is from the Kansas City Star. Missouri Democratic U.S. Senate candidate Trudy Bush Valentine apologized on Wednesday for participating in a prominent St. Louis ball hosted by an organization that barred black and Jewish people. Bush Valentine was crowned the Queen of Love and Beauty in the 1977 Veiled Prophet Ball, according to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch archives. The ball is run by the Veiled Prophet organization, an all-male club formed in 1878 by upper-class white people in St. Louis in response to a protest by railroad workers. The organization did not allow black or Jewish members until 1979 and incorporated racist imagery in their ceremonies. Bush Valentine apologized, saying she needed to acknowledge her past shortcomings. Her participation was first reported by The Intercept. Ahead of the August 2nd primary, which is now passed, Kuntz has launched a new ad attacking Bush Valentine for her participation in the Veiled Prophet Ball, an event more than a century old that was founded by former Confederate officers with costumes resembling Ku Klux Klan robes. The organization behind the event, now known as Fair St. Louis, did not allow Jewish or black members until 1979. A 2014 piece in The Atlantic stated that the parade and ensuing ball were quote-unquote meant to reinforce the values of the elite on the working class of the city. And a St. Louis City website said it was used for quote-unquote reinforcing the notion of a benevolent cultural elite. And then this is from Yahoo News, and I apologize for the redundant bits. Bush Valentine was crowned the ball's queen of love and beauty in 1977. At age 20, the same year, two members of the civil rights group Action were arrested outside for protesting the event. Five years earlier, two members of the organization, one of them Jewish, crashed the ball and unmasked the prophet, who was a Monsanto executive. Well, according to reporting from The Intercept, Bush Valentine returned at least twice, including in 1990 to be honored beside other former queens, and her daughter participated in the event in 2010. The ball made national headlines last year after old newspaper clippings circulated on social media of actress Ellie Kemper being crowned Queen of Love and Beauty in 1999 when she was a 19-year-old student at Princeton. 
Kemper apologized, saying the century-old organization that hosted the debutante ball had an unquestionably racist, sexist, and elitist past. I was not aware of this history at the time, but ignorance is no excuse. I was old enough to have educated myself before getting involved. And I have to plead ignorance, I had no idea who this actress Ellie Kemper was, but I read her bio and prep for the show, and apparently she's from one of the wealthiest families in Missouri, which probably explains her connection to the uh, Veiled Prophet organization. But where did this idea of the Veiled Prophet come from? So, there was a yearly harvest festival slash trade show, which had been started in 1856, called the St. Louis Agricultural and Mechanical Fair. It drew a lot of people and featured agricultural crops, crafts and demonstrations, etc., but apparently there was a fear that the rapidly growing city of Chicago was beginning to outcompete St. Louis as a manufacturing center and agricultural shipping point. So a number of prominent bigwigs, businessmen, civic leaders, etc., got together and founded the Veiled Profit Organization and devised something called the Veiled Profit Fair in an attempt to breathe new life into the aforementioned annual agricultural and mechanical fair. In 1878, brothers Charles and Alonzo Slayback concocted a mythology for an elite secret society centered around the idea of the Veiled Prophet. Charles was a grain broker who spent several reconstruction years in New Orleans and became acquainted with Mardi Gras which would influence and shape Veiled Prophet festivities and traditions. And Alonzo was a former colonel with the Missouri Cavalry Regiment, which fought for the Confederacy. They borrowed the term Veiled Prophet from Irish poet Thomas More's work, La La Rook, Tulip-Cheeked and Persian, an oriental romance consisting of four narrative poems. In Moore's work, the Veiled Prophet of Coruscant was a revolutionary religious founder and chemist who considered himself a prophet. One of his experiments resulted in his face becoming badly burnt. He became known as al makana the Veiled, referring to the veil he subsequently wore to hide his disfigurement. The brothers also incorporated elements of Comus, as in the mystic crew of Comus, a New Orleans carnival crew. In Greek mythology, Comus was the god of festivity and revels, and the cupbearer and son of Dionysus. The first veiled prophet parade slash visit of the prophet took place in 1878, when, as alluded to earlier, business was in need of revitalization. The prophet was said to be a world traveler who chose to bless St. Louis. According to reporter Walter E. Orthwain, a kind of Santa Claus for grown-ups. Each year, a member of the organization or society was secretly chosen to assume the role of or represent the prophet. The first was John G. Priest, a local businessman and social and civic leader. He was one of five sitting members of the police commission and had played an active role in quelling the prior years aforementioned railroad strike. In the parade, the prophet was represented as a giant figure on a horse-drawn float. It supposedly stood about 25 feet tall and had a covered face. Surrounding the figure were members of the prophet's court, including a scribe, two high priests, an executioner, and armored guards. The Veiled Prophet organization traditionally kept not only the identity of the annual prophet a secret, at least ostensibly, but also its membership roles. Addressing this matter, journalist and author Walter B. Stevens wrote, Mystery as to preparations greatly enhances public interest and means that the membership must be moved by altruistic motives in giving their fellow Missourians this annual pageant that no public limelight could be focused on the doers. In 2021, public records revealed that the leaders of the organization still remained, quote-unquote, some of the region's most powerful businessmen and dynastic patricians. The first Veiled Prophet Ball took place the same year as the first parade, 1878, 
The ball took place after the parade, with the costumed men retiring to change into evening wear. Each year, that year's Veiled Prophet would choose a young woman to be the quote-unquote Belle of the Ball, a title which was changed to the Queen of Love and Beauty in 1884. Perhaps not surprisingly, the first girl chosen by that year's prophet, John G. Priest, was the daughter of one of the founders of the organization, Suzanne or Susie Slayback, the daughter of the aforementioned Alonzo Slayback. And so finally, to get back to what makes involvement with this organization so controversial, the history or accusations of racism. And in that Young Turks clip I had been watching, Jenk shows an image of an old illustration of a Klansman with a gun, and he claims it represents the Veiled Prophet organization. And it's a really kind of creepy yet interesting image I'll include it in the YouTube version. Uh, but I was researching it, and apparently Jenk was incorrect. But in fairness, that's not entirely his fault. Even back in the day, this image of a Klansman was wrongly associated with the Veiled Prophet organization. It turns out that it's a woodcut that dates back to 1875, so before the Veiled Prophet organization was even founded. In 1878, in advance of the first Veiled Prophet parade, a publication called the Missouri Republican printed the image with the quote, the original Veiled Prophet himself, adding that, once again in quotes, it will be readily observed from the accoutrements of the Prophet, a pistol, a shotgun, and a billy club, that the procession is not likely to be stopped by streetcars or anything else. Apparently, the reference to streetcars has something to do with the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, at least according to Thomas M. Spencer, and here's a quote, newspaper feature stories since the 1950s have described the first veiled profit parade as a way of healing the wounds of a bitter labor management fight. The 1877 St. Louis general strike, he wrote, he added, however, that the first Veiled Prophet parade was, in quotes, more a show of power than a gesture of healing. As previously mentioned at the top of the episode, the Veiled Prophet organization didn't allow black or Jewish members until 1979. Apparently, the Veiled Prophet parade itself traditionally drew black and white citizens alike, but membership was long reserved for white elites. Prior to World War II, the African-American community in St. Louis had developed its own tradition in response. They took to crowning a veiled prophet's queen. The event quickly gained popularity and inspired similar events and traditions among other racial groups. In 1966, rector of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, Walter W. Witt, voiced his opposition to the Veiled Prophet Ball in a widely circulated letter published in the Post-Dispatch. He wrote the following, I recall my fascination some ten years ago when I was told that St. Louis had a Veiled Prophet parade. I was new to the city then, and I presume that this gala event must be some climactic community celebration, perhaps historical in nature. Then to discover that this was the yearly feast of the rich, culminating in a quote-unquote coming-out ball at the municipal auditorium, was indeed a disappointment. Since then, disappointment has given place to disgust. The spectacle of the wealthy daring to parade through the neighborhoods or near neighborhoods of the poor is outrageous. And the ritual, is it merely cute? Or are we witnessing the honest-to-God cult of the affluent, with its prophets, queens, attending angels, heavenly courts taken seriously and paid for dearly by the educated business and professional men of the community? Could it be turned into a genuine community event? I have an idea if the powers would contact me. I have several outstandingly beautiful candidates in my parish for the Queen of Love and Beauty. Mind you, these candidates are not Marie Institute graduates, nor are they currently attending Wellesley, Smith, or Vassar, nor are they likely to be. But they would indeed add beauty. Then again, they would probably be disqualified. They suffer from one serious limitation. They are black. 
And so that concludes that quotation. And then that same year, Percy Green, head of the activist group Action, an acronym standing for Action Committee to Improve Opportunities for Negroes. Kind of an outdated term there, but uh, this is something that transpired decades ago. But he distributed leaflets calling for the end of the Veiled Prophet Parade. This was in part in response to the killing of a robbery suspect by St. Louis police. He referred to the ball as, quote-unquote, the personification of St. Louis racism and white supremacy. The following year, Action scheduled a so-called City Dwellers Week that would coincide with Veiled Prophet events. They codenamed the project Target 84, which referred to the Prophet's 84th visit. The goal was to force an end to the Veiled Prophet organization, or at least its activities, which Reverend William L. Matthias, another rector at St. Stephen's, had called a symbol of racial and economic oppression. Action sponsored a Black Veiled Prophet Ball, which was meant to function as a kind of parody of the original. They crowned a quote-unquote queen of human justice, selected based on the number of tickets they sold or were sold on their behalf. On October 1st, 1967, a small group of demonstrators, led by a St. Louis University professor named Patrick Douglas, marched in the suburb of Clayton. They contended that the Veiled Prophet Ball was, in quotes, offensive to the Negro community and should be transformed into a children's event. The following weekend, roughly 50 demonstrators protested on the sidewalk, across from the Keel Auditorium, where the actual Veiled Prophet Ball was being held. Some of the leaders of the protests demanded entrance to the event without tickets. Three were arrested on charges of disturbing the peace and failure to obey the commands of a police officer, but were later released on bond. The three were Esther Davis, the Queen of Human Justice, Precious Barnes, dressed as the Black Veiled Prophet, and the aforementioned rector of St. Stephen's, Walter W. Witt. There were journalists who claimed to have been roughed up by the police, and there were reports of cops holding hands and hats in front of cameras to prevent pictures being taken. A young seminary student by the name of Ron A. Gould said he had taken a photo of a policeman beating a black woman, and that another police officer had then stepped in and smashed his camera with a baton and proceeded to step on the exposed film. He filed a complaint against the police department, which conveniently found that he had no case. And so I decided to go over the bit about protest and demonstrators clashing with police at veiled profit events. Uh, once again, to try to give at least a rough sketch of the racial tensions between the veiled profit organization and the black community, as well as other racial or minority groups. As we already covered, not only were black people not allowed admittance into the organization until 1979, uh, but the same applies or applied to Jewish people as well. And the tensions between protesters and the police, and even the mistreatment or abuse of protesters by police, you could maybe make an argument, well, that was the police, not the Veiled Prophet organization directly, and there might be some merit to that. But then I guess you could make the counter-argument that the police were perhaps, in a sense, acting on behalf of or serving the interests of this elitist organization and the rich, powerful white men behind it or who make up its membership. And we probably shouldn't overlook the long-standing connection or relationship between higher-ups in the police department and the Veiled Prophet organization. And so, obviously, there's been comparisons made between the Veiled Prophet organization and the KKK. I have to say, as far as I can tell from my amateur research into the subject, it doesn't seem like the Veiled Prophet organization is as virulently racist or has the same history of brutal racial violence, uh, lynchings, etc. as the Klan, But it is an elitist and was, maybe still is to some degree, uh, a racist organization. Uh, 
It strikes me more as a kind of old boys club, and this isn't an excuse, but it doesn't surprise me that an organization founded by wealthy white men in the 19th century had racist membership policies or barred minorities, but once again, I don't think, as far as I can tell, that they were or are as bad as the Klan. But I still think, given the organization's elitist nature, that it's right for politicians or celebrities to denounce or distance themselves from it. But I want to know what this veiled prophet thing was all about, and now I know more than I ever wanted to about it. Uh, maybe you guys learned something too. I hope you at least enjoyed it. Uh, as always, thanks for listening.